Welcome to the DK Kim Foundation lecture series offered by the Center for Asian Business at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by a grant from the DK Kim Foundation in Ontario, California. Delighted to be here to share some thoughts and um, information about what's happening around the world. So I uh, wanted to be a bit more interactive. I'm going to give you a bit more of a presentation uh, for maybe about 30, 40 minutes or so. And I want it to be a Q&A. So before we even get started, let's make this more interactive. How many of you have been to Hong Kong before? Excellent. How many of you are aware of uh, the current situation that's happening? OK, that helps me in terms of uh, the information that I'll be providing. So uh, as Dr. Hapak was saying, I will be focusing more on the trade aspect. But the thing is, around the world right now, it's very difficult to separate trade from politics and from uh, personal liberty, from uh, what's happening around the world. So everything is mixed in a little bit. But because my job right now is with the uh, Los Angeles World Trade Center, as well as the Los Angeles Economic Development Corporation, uh, our role is really as a nonprofit organization serving all of LA County to focus on how do we attract foreign direct investments and investors to come to Los Angeles so we can create good jobs for the local economy. So with that said, a lot of folks don't realize the impact of international trade, what that means to not only the United States, but specifically for the Los Angeles region. So in order for us to really get a full context of what's happening, I'm gonna go back in history a little bit so we get ourselves on the same page and we can discuss what's happening now. Now, uh, a lot of you already been to, been to Hong Kong, that you guys understand what's happening in Hong Kong, but um, the situation we're in right now when it comes to the political turmoil really started with trade. Um, so let's go all the way back. If you look at Hong Kong, um, since before uh, 200 BC to about you know, 1850s or so, Hong Kong for about 2,000 years belonged to China under various dynastic rules. Uh, whichever dynasty uh, were there, they saw Hong Kong as a port. And mostly what they did was in Hong Kong was a small fishing village, uh, whether it's salt production, whether it's pearl uh, harvesting, whether it's a fishing village, that's what Hong Kong's role was for many years. However, in the 1800s, things start to change very, very quickly. As Europe started to see the, the value of uh, certain commodities in Hong Kong and in China specifically, they wanted to basically get access to silk, to tea, and to porcelain, which was only unique to China. And China back then had a rule called the Canton system, which meant that if you want to get access to the Chinese uh, goods and the Chinese system, you could only access China through one region, which is uh, the Canton region. And Guangzhou, uh, back then is called Hong Kong, now it's called Guangzhou, is really that center. And Hong Kong is really just about uh, now, about an hour by uh, really 30 minutes by, by high-speed rail uh, connected to, to that region. So you can see the importance of that region. Now, for as uh, the, the European trade is growing, what you saw was there was a trade imbalance, as you heard our president's been saying all the time. Trade deficit is a huge issue. We are... Uh, the Europeans were saying, we are s buying so much silk, tea, and porcelain from China. And China would usually only accept payment in silver, which was very difficult back in the 1800s to get. So what ended up happening is you have a tra huge trade deficit, and they desperately wanted to sell goods into China. However, China didn't really need anything from uh, Europe. The only thing they bought were luxury items, like clocks and watches that they didn't produce. But that deficit was just really uh, too much for them to handle at that point. So there was an internal tactic. And one of the tactics they decided to use was to deploy the, the British East India Asia, uh, sorry, East India uh, uh, Company to start trading and start bringing opium into uh, China. Now, opium was legalized in the British Empire back then, but not legal in China. So the East and India company really had to smuggle the, the uh, opium into China. And then at a certain point, they start growing 
um, opium in Bengal, what is now known as Bangladesh. And now you have an increased volume of opium that was able to be smuggled into China. Now, China is dealing with uh, some of the issues that now in, in, in modern days where we can see uh, the opiate uh, 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 crisis that we're facing right now. When your citizens are, are, are addicted to, to certain types of drugs, it becomes a huge problem. And so now um, the Chinese citizens were buying uh, opium and the silver is now finally flowing back to Europe. Now there's a trade balance in that sense. But for the Chinese government and the Chinese emperor, it was not a fair deal. So they actually reached out to Queen Victoria herself and asked for her um, to approach and to appeal to her morality to basically saying, this is not right. Please stop this illegal trade of opium into our country. Without getting a response, uh, from Queen Victoria, uh, the Emperor of China decided to take action. And so what they did is basically they sent their army forces into uh, Canton and seized um, some of these British merchants and merchant companies and uh, seized their goods. And in doing so, they were able to obtain uh, about 2.66 million pounds of opium. That's a huge amount of opium. And that was justified in the Chinese perspective. But at the same time, in the British perspective, you just wage war against the British Empire. So they were able to send in their royal army, I'm sorry, the Royal Navy to start attacking China. And China at that point wasn't able to, do, to, to really defend themselves. So the, the British Empire was able to easily beat uh, the Chinese forces and in doing so, created uh, the Treaty of Nanjing, or back then it's called Nanking, and now it's called Nanjing. And in 1842, uh, this treaty, amongst many things, uh, was the beginning of what this current situation was, because part of the negotiation was that China will cede the island of Hong Kong to um, the British Empire as a crown colony. This is a major, uh, major defeat for, for um, uh, the, the Chinese government and the Chinese uh, empire. And at that point, um, they started to, to work more closely with the Brits. However, that was not enough because what the British empire really wanted was full access to all of China, not just Canton or Guangzhou. So they also wanted to make sure that all of China was, was open to all British merchant companies. They wanted to legalize uh, the opium trade. And also they want their foreign imports from Europe, especially from um, uh, the British Empire, going into China to be exempt from duties. And then lastly, this was a, a, a huge issue for the Chinese. They wanted to make sure that when there's a treaty, the English version of that treaty trumps the Chinese version. So in context, it's kind of like us negotiating a contract with, um, I don't know, Indonesia or Japan. And then later on, they're saying, you know what, the interpretation is not right. Our version actually precedes your version. So whatever uh, we say is going to be right in your own country. So that was a huge issue that the Chinese wouldn't concede. And because of that, um, the British Empire had another excuse to continue that war. This time they employed uh, the, the uh, alliance of the French and the Russian, and in doing so, were able to defeat the Chinese again. And this time around, they actually went all the way to Beijing, and there are a couple actions that were very um, insulting to the, the Chinese government, including uh, burning the Summer Palace, which is a royal retreat uh, that's been an ancient uh, stronghold for the Chinese empire uh, and dynasty. And there are many priceless artifacts and, and um, goods that were looted back then. And I bring this context is because it's important for us to kind of look at things from both sides. And I think a lot of the times what we're seeing right now is a perspective in terms of the modern lens. But when you're looking at um, historical context, sometimes you have to look a different perspective. Whose view are you looking at from? So at this point, you know, again, not being political or anything, just want to give you the context so you can see in different circumstances, you can see things different way. Because of this, there was another convention, another treaty that was signed, this time with three treaties that were signed. And I'll just highlight the part that uh, uh, relates to Hong Kong. 
not only Hong Kong Island, and because you guys have been to, many of you have been to Hong Kong, Kowloon is basically the, the part that's attached to China. So that side is now also ceded to um, uh, 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 the British Empire. So now combined Hong Kong and Kowloon belong to um, uh, the British Empire it, perpetually. And it was, another big insult for the Chinese government, but at that time, time they, they were okay with it. Now, after that, this is the beginning of the, the um, British Empire having more access to China, but that still wasn't enough, because what you can see is for the British Empire, they want to protect their territory now. It's a crown colony, and it's surrounded by property and, and land that was owned by the Chinese government. So they wanted a buffer. So in about 50 years' time, right after the China, China, Chinese were defeated uh, by another country, it was the first uh, Sino-Japanese War. And in 1895, when the Japanese defeated China, um, the British Empire, again, utilized this opportunity to really negotiate and push China to lease the new territory, which is a land that's uh, beyond Kowloon, but closer to Shenzhen as a buffer zone. So with that, they were able to get a 99-year lease from China to the British Empire or the United Kingdom. This becomes a huge and key component of what we have to talk about here. Because as you saw before the two treaties, the land was ceded to the U United Kingdom. However, the new territory was only leased to uh, uh, the United Kingdom. So there's a difference, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Now, it's, uh, the, this is now, uh, Hong Kong is now a British colony, and we're moving forward from uh, the 1800s into 1900, and you start seeing changes very quickly. But starting in the 1950s, Hong Kong started regrowing very quickly, and it started transforming itself from not only a fishing village, but into a shipping port. They were able to do transshipment from goods that were made in China, uh, and they were able to ship it to the rest of the world. And in the 1950s, you start seeing a change in that. They start moving from a transshipment port to manufacturing and industry. And they were manufacturing a lot of different things. And you're seeing this pattern repeat in many different countries as well over the, uh, over the next 30, 40 years. Back then, uh, when you see a made in Hong Kong label, everybody just basically thought cheap goods, buttons, artificial flowers, cheap shoes. It's not good product. But the thing is, you know what? It's cheap, so we'll, we'll buy it. And, um, because after the war, uh, a lot of the, these foreign companies that were located in China, specifically in Shanghai, started moving their headquarters and their office space into Hong Kong. And so that transformed what Hong Kong was because it became more cosmopolitan, it became more diverse. And in the 1960s and 70s, you start seeing different things happening. In 1978, uh, Deng Xiaoping, the premier of China, at that point started a, a, a opening of, up of China campaign. And when doing so, it really allowed China to start becoming the major manufacturing center that they are now. And with that, a lot of the manufacturing moved from Hong Kong into Shenzhen and Guangzhou. And to this day, if you look at the major manufacturing sector when it comes to uh, clothing, shoes, leather product, it's really from uh, concentrated in Guangzhou right now. And so what you saw was Hong Kong now start taking a different role. Rather than manufacturing, they're becoming more of a tourism, a finance, and a commercial center for the, uh, back then it's called the Orient. And so really it's an access point to access the rest of China. This continued to grow and really Hong Kong defined itself as uh, what they call the Pearl of the Orient uh, in the 70s and 80s and it really started to flourish. And that's when Hong Kong really came to, to really the imagination to the rest of the world as this exotic location, but that's modern, but that's m metropolitan. And you really have the, the uh, British influence while you have the Chinese culture combined together. It's the best of both worlds. And then as we're getting closer and closer to the end of the 99 year uh, lease term, um, the, the British government and the Chinese government at this point needed to start thinking about what's gonna happen when the 99 year lease comes to, to an end. And you see, as Hong Kong's population begin to grow, they no longer are stationed in just Hong Kong Island or Kowloon. They're developing in the new territory, which is the buffer zone. And the buffer zone now had as it's growing, becoming more and more populated, and you have more industry, and you have more people living there than the Hong Kong Island or Kowloon itself. So at that point, when you return in 1997, when you're supposed to return Hong Kong 
to China, do you just return to new territory and start creating three different uh, se separate regions where China, the territory that's returned back to China, and Hong Kong, Kowloon, that belongs to the UK? How does that work? So the British uh, government, uh, under the, the leadership of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, understood the importance of basically that relationship with China because they saw China was growing very quickly as well. They want to maintain that relationship. So in their negotiation, they signed the, uh, the Sino-British Joint Declaration in 1984, really setting out that the entire territory between the, the leased territory and also the land that was ceded to, to the UK will be combined together in 1997, completely returned to China. However, there was a period because they understood that the transition from a democracy and a British-owned colony into a communist regime will be very difficult. So what they wanted to do is basically another buffer zone that they want to create. So they said, you know what, for 50 years, we're going to keep uh, a separate system, one country, two system, and Hong Kong will operate based on this new thing called the basic law where although you have um, Hong Kong technically belongs to China, you're actually operating in a different system and the communist and socialist regime, their system will not be applied to Hong Kong for 50 years until 2047. And so in the negotiation, they put together a team of folks that negotiated what, what's the best way to move forward. And in 1990, uh, the Hong Kong Basic Law was introduced and accepted by the Chinese government and ratified at that point to move forward in 1997. So in 1997, officially, uh, governor of um, Hong Kong, Chris Patton, uh, officially worked with the UK government to hand Hong Kong back to uh, the Chinese government. And the transition was done. So now Hong Kong is once again China. Now, once that happened, there's been some disagreement in terms of how do you interpret this transition? Because you have to understand, um, a lot of folks are looking at what document actually guides this whole process. The joint declaration that I mentioned, the Sino-British Joint Declaration signed in 1984, to most folks that were working on the project at that point, felt that this was a declaration, and this declaration created the basic law. So the basic law actually belongs under the declaration. However, some other folks are saying the joint declaration is a part of the Chinese constitution because Hong Kong is a part of China. When you have that two different view, this basic law has a different parent. And that's a very different way of looking at things because either you're looking at it from a communist perspective or you're looking at it as a treaty perspective. That's creating some, some issue in terms of what people are thinking. Now, you have to understand the context of basically what happened after 97. Uh, uh, around the 1980s and 1990s, China was growing very quickly. And then everybody's already talking about the rise of China. But by 1997, China was becoming a major dominant player. And uh, in the early 2000s, um, you see China employed something called the Go Out campaign, which is uh, a campaign that the national government was really recommending their companies go out of China and start investing internationally and start becoming a global player. In 2008, at the 2008 Olympics, you saw that was kind of the coming out party for China, really making a big statement that they're a global player. And their influence was strong, and I'll tie that back into Los Angeles very quickly. There is another key component that we have to look at because as China was really growing with their power and their trade with the rest of the world, a lot of companies are really looking at this 1.3, 1.4 billion uh, a population, which also equates to 1.3 or 1.4 billion consumers. They want to access that market. They know that market's growing very quickly. So they start setting up their headquarters and now a lot of them are actually moving to Shanghai and opening up. Uh, their operation there. And now Shanghai, as you probably have seen uh, from the 1970s to now, from a, uh, really many of the land was kind of farmland into the, the, the skyscraper central of the entire world located in one place. It's this huge, huge transformation. And then in some people's eyes, what we saw was a transfer of power and also the concentration of the focus in terms of accessing, accessing China. You no longer need to basically work through Hong Kong to access China. You can go directly to Shanghai. So why even deal with Hong Kong? So Hong Kong's economy is becoming a bit more uh, uh, buoyant in that sense. Nobody really knew what's going to happen then.
So China was rising and rising. And then uh, just about two, two and a half years ago, uh, what you saw was um, the Chinese market changed very quickly. Their labor costs were increasing. At the same time, they were uh, becoming this global player where their companies were going out. But they start investing a lot of their, their capital outside of China. And in Los Angeles, what you saw was a lot of our recent development after 2008, after the recession, was really funded and fueled by Chinese investments. Just look at downtown Los Angeles alone, or even the uh, LAX area. You'll see that a lot of uh, the new uh, uh, high-rises that were being built are funded by Chinese company. So if you guys know the area around Sapo Center, uh, directly across from it, you'll see a company called uh, um, Beijing Oceanwide, putting about 1.2 to 1.5 billion dollars into a condo project with um, a retail. Uh, right up the street from that is Shenzhen Hazen, 700 million dollars. Uh, diagonally across from that is um, a Shanghai Greenland with 1.2 billion dollars. Combined together in a, a matter of about two, three years, you have about four billion dollars tossed into that entire region. This is not counting the the 300 or 100 million dollar project. We're just talking about the the projects that are over 500 million dollars all concentrated within one square mile of the Staples Center. This is all Chinese investment. So you can see the power and the influence that's having on just Los Angeles downtown alone, let alone the rest of the world, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, you name it. But I think what happened was also all these um, uh, investors were were, were, were investing their, their dollars so quickly that you saw the National Reserve in China dropping very quickly. And some say that they went from about $3 uh, trillion in, in reserve down to about $800 billion in the matter of two, three years. That's when the Chinese government basically said, uh, we're not going to play with this anymore. Let's stop this. And what we saw was the capital flow restriction that happened that a lot of the Chinese companies are not allowed to invest outside of China anymore, specifically with hotel, real estate, and entertainment projects. Now, guess what projects are most prevalent here in Los Angeles? <laughs> Hotel, real estate, and entertainment. So we got really hit hard at that point. This is about two years ago because we're so used to Chinese investments coming in. Uh, not only the real estate and the hotel projects, don't forget uh, Dali and Wanda came in. Uh, they were going to build a $1 billion project in Beverly Hills. They also invest in legendary pictures. Uh, they bought the legendary pictures for about $3.5 billion. They're trying to buy the Dick Clark production. They bought Iron Man, uh, the, the triathlon races. Uh, they also bought uh, AMC, the, the movie uh, chain. So all these investment that were coming in just out of nowhere stopped. So that transformed the way that uh, the world is interacting with China. And because people are still dependent on these Chinese investment, all of a sudden folks are now looking back towards Hong Kong. Because a lot of these companies from China actually have operations in Hong Kong. So they are seen uh, and they have a different rule that's applied to them. So they don't have the same restrictions. So a lot of folks are trying to use Hong Kong as a way to move forward. So that's a key component that we have to look at. And then the trade war with China happened um, because President Trump started to basically impose these trade tariffs against China. And as most of you know now, we have over $300 billion worth of goods um, that uh, uh, are, are on the subject to this list because we import a lot of goods from China. Now, I'm going to move towards this part where I want to make the connection directly with Los Angeles and why we care so much about Chinese investments and Hong Kong investments. So first, when we think of trade, usually we only think of import-export, but a lot of people forget the third component, which is foreign direct investment, which is what I was talking about before. And the foreign direct investment, and we did this report uh, at the World Trade Center Los Angeles every single year uh, for the last four years, and we quantified the number of foreign-owned establishments in Southern California alone. And a lot of times what you hear around uh, the news and some of the elected officials are saying international trade and trade and globalization is horrible for us. It's killing jobs here in the United States. I can't disagree with that completely. However, it's geographically uh, 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 sensitive. In Los Angeles, that's actually not true. Because if you look at our economy, we're really dependent on international trade. And from foreign direct investment, in our report, we found that every year we have over 10,000 foreign-owned establishments in Southern California, and about half of them are in LA County alone. 
and these foreign companies directly employ over 425,000 jobs, local jobs, contributing over $26 billion annually in wages to the local economy. So when you say international trade kills jobs, not here in LA, actually it creates a lot of great jobs. And if you look at the Department of Commerce, on average, uh, foreign direct investments and foreign companies pay anywhere from 10 to 25% more than local, uh, locally started companies. So this is a great thing for us. And I wanna bring another example, uh, and this is a huge issue for us. I was mentioning Dali and Wanda as they're coming in, they really wanna invest in Hollywood because they wanted to, to really increase their presence. They saw Hollywood as a, uh, a great tool for something that they saw as soft power. Um, in the United States, we haven't been really paying attention to that, but because of Hollywood, because of the entertainment industry, we're able to exert influence around the world in a way that people don't even understand. And China really wanted to get an understanding of how to do this. So they wanted to basically invest in, in film companies and really learn how to basically really create Hollywood style movies to influence the world in terms of their narratives and their, their perspective and their cultural values as well. And so at that point, um, at the World Trade Center in Los Angeles and LADC, we were getting a lot of questions from the media and public saying, Stephen, how do you feel about foreign invasion of Hollywood trying to corrupt our view of the world? And I had to remind them that only about 10, 15 years ago, there was a company called Sony um, that tried to basically buy uh, uh, Columbia Pictures. And at that point, people in Los Angeles and around the United States were saying, how did you feel about a Japanese foreign company trying to invade you know, our, our, our perspective? And it was a, a very hostile situation. But fast forward just a couple years ago, remember there was an incident where North Korea supposedly hacked Sony? and leaked the emails out uh, about the CEOs. And basically, there was a whole uh, movie with James Franco and Seth Rogen about North Korea. And it became a huge issue because how dare the North Koreans invade a US company? <laughs> and these folks are now seeing that Sony is now seen as a local company. So, from our perspective, a lot of these international companies, once they come to the United States, they become a local company. People forget that Toyota is a Japanese company. They forget that Siemens is a German company because once they're here, they hire locally. And the same thing can be true of these companies. Not that all of them will be, but some of them can be. So that's why foreign direct investment is so important to us. And that's why we pay so much attention to it. In fact, the reason why I pay so much attention to it is because if you look uh, at the list of the top investors here by the number of jobs created and number of companies here, Hong Kong, with a small population of seven, eight million people and a small island, is our 22nd largest investor here in the, in the Los Angeles region, creating over 2,000 direct jobs here. And this is just direct jobs. That means Hong Kong companies with a parent company in Hong Kong, not counting the Hong Kong companies that came over here and decided to operate as a US company. So their, their influence here is so strong, and that's just foreign direct investment. Now we have a look at international trade in a traditional sense, import exports. As I was mentioning 150 years ago, that was one of the reasons why the British Empire wanted Hong Kong is because of that port access. Hong Kong continued to develop as one of the major ports around the world. And Los Angeles at the same time, especially over the last 30, 40 years, emerged as one of the most important trade hubs in the entire world. And a lot of Angelinos, including some of us in this room, might not know this. Because when I ask them, you know, do you know we have a port here? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, Port of Long Beach is fantastic. It's the largest port in the world, right? No, the reason why you know about the Port of Long Beach is because it's along the 405 and you can see it. But actually, right next to it is the Port of Los Angeles, the number one container port in North America. Port of Long Beach is right next door, the number two container port in, uh, in North America. Combined together with the fifth, uh, sorry, with the ninth largest port complex in the world, and we're able to do this is because of the growth of Asia, specifically China, as a manufacturing center. And Americans are addicted to cheap goods. We want to buy those cheap shoes and cheap T-shirts. So they're coming into the WalMarts and the J.C. Penneys and the Coles and the Targets and the Home Depot, 
And when they're coming over here, because of our port access, they come to Los Angeles first and gets distributed to the rest of the United States. Los Angeles uh, Customs District is the number one customs district in the United States. Last year, over $430 billion worth of tr goods uh, were moved through the Los Angeles Customs District. Our number one trading partner, China, about $170 billion. But what people don't, all, don't realize is that separate from that, you see Hong Kong is actually our sixth largest trading partner. But what's really, really um, uh, significant and important to see Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven. You s notice a pattern? They're all in Asia. And because of the proximity, and that's why I want to go back, to by ocean cargo coming into Los Angeles, that's why we become the gateway. Over 858,000 direct jobs are related to the trade and logistics sector here in Los Angeles. Combined with the 425,000 jobs I was talking about with foreign direct investment, tell me again that international trade is killing jobs. So the, that's why for us, we're, we're very concerned about what's happening around the world when it comes to international trade because so many of our jobs are dependent on international trade. Now, when we're talking about international trade, I don't want to just talk about ocean going cargo because people forget that our airport is actually a major uh, port destination as well. That's why it's called airport. Uh, over a billion dollars worth of goods move through LAX every single year. So your high value goods like your iPhones and your iWatches are usually flown over, not shipped over. And on top of it, you have all these uh, passengers that are going back and forth. Did you know every daily nonstop direct flight coming into Los Angeles from overseas is equivalent to about a billion dollars worth of economic impact per year to the region? So these daily nonstop flight from American, American Airlines, Air China, uh, uh, um, and then we've been launching brand new flights uh, connecting us to other places like Chengdu or Changsha uh, from Hainan Air and different things. These are very important to us. So Cathay Airline, it's their direct nonstop flight to Hong Kong. Every single direct nonstop flight is a billion dollars to us. So when there's a disruption with the Hong Kong airport, and now we're hearing that United Airlines might, might be reconsidering whether to continue their direct non-stop flight to Hong Kong. This is a huge threat to not only the passengers, but also the air cargo that's coming in. And that's why we have to pay attention to that. So combined together, um, you can see some of the impact. I'm just talking about the basic trade aspect. Um, don't forget Hong Kong is a major hub of film and television as well. Their influence over how China developed with their media campaign and also their, their film and television uh, uh, industry really started with Hong Kong even back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, you know, Jackie Chan, uh, ja uh, Jackie Chan and Anita Mui and Leslie Chung, all these great stars really influenced how China developed their um, uh, film industry. And so with that said, there's another connection there. There. Of course, there's technology that's been transferred between the both sides. And this is, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple other issues, but uh, let's go back to, to now, coming all the way back of the issue we have right now, where we're at. As you know, recently, there's been a lot of protests, a lot of uh, uh, turmoil based on the, the 2019 Fugitive Offenders and Mutual Legal Assistance in Criminal Matters legislation, which is known as the extradition law. So basically, this law that was uh, proposed by Carrie Lam, the CEO of um, uh, uh, Hong Kong, will allow extradition of criminals into China for uh, uh, court hearings. And so some saw that as a violation of the very tenets of basic law and one country, two system. Again, going back to what I was saying before, it depends on how you look at it. If you see it as a part of the Chinese constitution, the Chinese constitution can change it anytime because you belong, this, this rule belongs to, 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 to the Chinese constitution. On the other hand, if you saw as a treaty, it's an agreement between China and the uh, uh, UK. So if you're gonna change that, you have to basically get agreement from both parties before you can change a treaty. So based on that, uh, that um, understanding of where we're at, this is where the fluctuation is. So because of that, there's been a lot of disruption as you've seen uh, around Hong Kong and it's creating a bit of uncertainty. Because of what we talk about with the China trade tariff, we talked about um, with uh, China decreasing their investments in the United States uh, and around the world and people are looking at Ch uh, Hong Kong as a solution 
Now, people are not quite sure whether Hong Kong is stable enough and whether they're independent enough for them to be able to continue to partner with Hong Kong to get access to China. So with that, with, with uh, uh, the, the economy, when you don't have certainty, it's very difficult for, for businesses to make those long-term commitments to make sure that they secure their supply chain or uh, uh, their, their commitments to, to enter China or Hong Kong in any way. So now more and more folks are looking at other regions, including Singapore as a financial center, while they're waiting for this to happen. They're not quite sure whether they should take that trip to Hong Kong because they're not sure whether the, the airport is going to be disrupted or transportation is going to be disrupted. Now, more and more so, you're also seeing things are starting to change. I was mentioning the foreign direct investment that's coming here in Los Angeles has been huge, right? So we have to look back a couple of years. I used to work at the Port of Los Angeles, and we saw that China shipping made a huge investment in the Port of Los Angeles with over $250 million to up their terminal. At the same time, um, shortly after actually, OCL, which is a Hong Kong shipping line, uh, decided to move forward with Long Beach with the Middle Harbor project, which is a $2 billion modernization project to turn it into the first fully automated terminal in the United States and Long Beach. It's a huge terminal with a huge investment. In the middle of the project, Costco, not Costco, but C-O-S-C-O, -O, a Chinese shipping company, that merged with uh, China Shipping decided to buy OCL for $6 billion. So now Costco, OCL, China Shipping became one major conglomerate. So you can see these interaction between these international companies and the uncertainty of basically the political situation is really having a direct effect in terms of what we can do. Part of the reason is this, when you have a foreign transaction that's happening in the United States, the United States actually has a right to control a certain part of that. And they use a, a, a mechanism called CFIUS, the, the Co Committee on Foreign Investment in the US. Basically, they can say that if there's a national security issue, we can look at it. For example, if Huawei is trying to basically acquire certain technology or certain companies in the United States that will enter uh, our telecommunication system, that might be seen as a national security. So they will basically block that from happening, citing CFIUS as a, a way to regulate it. So as you're having more tension with China, this is becoming applied more and more um, uh, uh, in a strict manner. And when Hong Kong, we're not sure as we're moving forward whether it's being seen as more a part of China or more independent that is going to create more issues as Hong Kong investment is coming into the, the, the United States and being seen uh, negatively. So combined together, we're having a lot of doubts in terms of what's happening next, and we really would like to get some clarity, but unfortunately, we're not able to do that. So that is where we're at based on the history coming all the way here. Now, I, I uh, want to give some time for us to basically have a bit of a discussion and some Q&A, but I want to basically add a, a personal uh, kind of anecdotal story to this because it also has to do with identity. Um, so as uh, Dr. Pector was say, saying earlier, I was born in Hong Kong. I immigrated to the United States when I was eight years old. And partially it's because uh, my mother uh, was born, uh, my grandfather is a, a Chinese national he moved to Indonesia to start a rubber plant. And uh, when he, uh, shortly after the Cultural Revolution, uh, there was uh, this campaign to basically saying, hey, be uh, a Chinese national, bring your children back to the motherland and learn our language and become part of China. So my father being a patri uh, my grandfather being a patriot said, please go. So sent all seven of his children to China. And at that point, with the, all the various changes that are happening, um, what ended up happening was all his children uh, end up not being able to go back to Indonesia. So they weren't able to see him until the 1980s. And my mother, during this time, um, uh, I, I talk a lot, as you can see. I, I get my big mouth from my mother. <laughs> and uh, she was saying something that's not quite nice uh, about the, the former leader, uh, Mao Zedong, at that time. And it got to her that she might uh, be punished in some way, per, uh, potentially work camp. Being scared of that, she found a way to move to Hong Kong. So that's how our family ended up in Hong Kong. That's where I was born. And so when she heard in 1980s, uh, around the time of the 1984 Sino-British uh, Joint Declaration, 
the uncertainty that was going to be happening in the future, there were a lot of Hong Kong uh, folks that were with, with means decided to move to Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, uh, UK, wherever. So we were one of those families. I moved to the United States. So coming over here, um, I was here. I became naturalized. Uh, we actually became United States citizens because my mom, utilizing her, uh, her Indonesian passport, won the diversity lottery. Uh, one of these uh, programs that uh, our president is now talking about eliminating. So I'm glad that I was able to come here and become uh, a part of this nation and be able to talk about uh, the, the, the various changes that are here and be able to contribute having worked in the city government and working in this. But this is why I feel so strongly about having this dialogue and this understanding. But what was very interesting was that in uh, December of last year, I took a trip on the, at the invitation of the Chinese government to talk about China-US relationship at the uh, 70th anniversary of the normalization of the relationship between China and US. And so I was there uh, with a number of different uh, government officials talking about the challenges and the opportunities that were there. However, I arrived two days after uh, the CFO Huawei was arrested in Canada, and there was a lot of tension between the two countries, and there are a lot of rumors uh, being flown about basically saying there might be retaliation against the United States for basically encouraging and basically uh, pushing Canada to, to arrest uh, the CFO for Huawei and extraditing to the United States. So Stephen, if you don't have to be here, you shouldn't be here. So I was a bit nervous, and I said, but I'm a United States citizen. And the person who was warning me um, said, Stephen, but you said you were born in Hong Kong, which meant that in your passport, it will say that you were born in Hong Kong with a US citizenship. China has the right to basically say they don't recognize naturalization. I said, that's fine and all, but don't forget, I was born in 1978 in Hong Kong under British colony. I'm a, I'm a subject of the British government. I'm a British national overseas. I was never born a Chinese citizen, so they have no right to basically take that right away from me. And they said, well, you can argue with them once they arrest you. <laughs> Do you want that? But that's a, a key point, right? Because we don't quite know with this situation, this is an experiment in itself that's not quite known what the future is going to look like. The folks that are Got, got transferred after, that were born after 1997, are they Hong Konger or are they Chinese? I see myself as a Chinese American, but I also see myself as a Hong Kong uh, person. I see myself as American. So it's, a, it's this identity that's making it very difficult and very challenging. And as we're getting to this world where more and more cultures are starting to mix and our, uh, the globalization in terms of um, the way that business and industries collaborating with each other is getting further and further away from being able to pull apart. That's becoming our identity. This is the struggle that we're having right now. But what's important is the fact that we can have these dialogues and understand that there are differences and uh, sometimes a misunderstanding. But having this dialogue allows us to get a better understanding. And that's why I'm really grateful uh, for LMU to really set up this type of discussion to really have um, uh, various folks share their perspective, that it's not as simple as what's being shown on the news. There can be different perspective based on the fact that are you looking at a 2,000 year history? Are you looking at it from just 150 years? Or are you looking at it just since 1997? Because you can have very different conclusion coming at the same time. For me, uh, it's not my place to talk about the politics and where, where the position is. What I can say is right now, this is not good for business. And as LA is so dependent on international trade, and my job is to really attract foreign direct investment coming into the Los Angeles region so that we can have more jobs, so that we can decrease the likelihood that in the future, our residents might not have a job and will fall into homelessness. I mentioned all these number ones that we have that we're very proud of, but one thing that we have to not notice and note as well is that we're the number one homeless capital in the United States with over 60,000 homeless individuals. And it's very difficult for me to go to Texas and say, you know what, bring your company here to Los Angeles because we're so much cheaper and easier to do business. 
that's not going to happen. What I can say is go to Hong Kong, go to Japan, go to China, and said, if you're coming to the United States, LA is the place for you to set up your operation first, and you can expand to the rest of the United States. That's how we're able to really uh, quickly expand our job uh, base. So with that, that's my challenge, uh, the challenge I see every day. And that's uh, unfortunately just one component, because besides Hong Kong, we're now dealing uh, with the tension between Japan and Korea, uh, not knowing what's going to happen in the future for Taiwan, uh, what's going to happen with Brexit. Uh, the US-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement is not ratified. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I'm uh, usually an optimist, but uh, I, right now I have to say I'm a cautious optimist and I'm a bit concerned. Um, with that said, that concludes my remarks. I would like to open it up for discussion. I'm going to separate it into two parts. Uh, one, I'm going to just more generalize international trade. Second, I'm going to focus more on China. So when it comes to international trade right now, I feel that international trade has been seen as a, a scapegoat. Um, even back in the previous election, uh, when there was an election between Hillary Clinton and President Trump, um, we didn't see a lot of support for international trade. There was something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership where uh, 12 countries, including the United States, were gonna basically form an alliance, a trading bloc. Uh, this is the Pacific Rim countries, including Canada, Mexico, uh, Japan, New Zealand, so on and so forth. That is a countermeasure so that basically as China's influence begin to grow, you have these countries with like minded approach when it comes to trade, like labor practice and environmental practice come together. But in, even in that uh, election and that debate, neither Democrats nor Republicans really stood for TPP. So um, uh, 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 Secretary Clinton basically said she's going to step away from it. And of course, as soon as President Trump came in, he on day one walked away from TPP. And since then, both parties have not really embraced trade. That Republicans were formerly really the, the party for free trade, but we haven't heard much from it. So from uh, the recommendation is from the, from the uh, Democratic side, is really to look at the transforming um, and transitioning economy that we see right now. Uh, the genie is out of the bottle, and as much as we want to basically stop globalization, globalization is here. Unless you have a solution to basically walk back and basically turn us into uh, a, a country that's self-reliant and dependent, and what is that process going to look like? A lot of folks are basically saying, let's, let's manufacture here in the United States. Let's bring the good jobs of manufacturing back here. Great. If you can do that, that's fantastic. But I ask you, the folks in Texas and in Oklahoma and Minnesota, are you willing to pay $30 per t-shirt at Walmart? Because the labor cost is going to be different, right? The reason why we're able to get the $2, $3 t-shirts is because of the labor standard and the shipping costs and the globalization of the whole supply chain is so transformed. That's how you're able to get it. You can't have it both ways. You can't have really, really, really cheap goods with also really, really high wages in that sense. And so there is uh, an ideal situation, of course we would like that, and that's why I would challenge a Democrat to really look at the reality rather than promising the public something that is an ideal that cannot be achieved, give the realistic um, uh, aspect of things. The other thing I wanna bring up with, with that is that Globalization is actually not taking away as many jobs as they're claiming. It's actually automation that's doing that. So the, if you're going to have a campaign against, you should have a campaign against robots, right? That's, that's the recommendation. Uh, but on the other hand, when it comes to, um, I forgot my train of thought, but uh, their rhetoric on China right now is that basically it's very easy to basically harp on China and basically saying China is a bad guy. Like no Democrats or Republicans alike, no one's willing to stand up and basically say, you know what, the reason why China has grown the way they are, they, 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 they have in the last uh, 20, 30 years, partially is because the United States have really invested in the manufacturing sector over there and really taken advantage of the trading relationship. So we've gotten something out of it, but now they've grown to a way to, to a point where we, we don't like where they're going and now we're saying that you know we want to walk away from it. So 
it, it, it's tied in, there's a history behind it. You can't basically walk away from something that you created. So this is a part where also I think is very important for us to really self-reflect in terms of um, as we're looking at the future, there is a way to move forward. I think there are many folks that would agree that uh, in many ways um, uh, the Chinese government and some of the practices are not exactly ideal uh, to the US government. That's worth correcting. However, I think we should work together with at the international community to set a standard to encourage China to change rather than basically tossing away our alliance with 11 other countries and going at it alone using a punitive measure like the trade tariff that will actually punish our people. I really, really value alliances and cooperate, co cooperative models like the UN and NATO and other um, uh, uh, systems that allows for exchange of these ideas. And I have to say, I'm a product of that because of the diversity visa allows for immigrants without means to be able to come here and have a voice in this country. Now I'm able to basically share with the mayor of Los Angeles and the governor of California, the different viewpoints. I'm uh, what they call 1.5 generation because I moved here when I was uh, uh, eight, eight years old. I will never be truly American in many people's eyes. Uh, my in-laws are actually from Kentucky, so you can imagine looking like this in Ashland, Kentucky, what that's going to be like every every Christmas. Uh, at the same time, when I go back to Hong Kong, I don't. I'm not a Hong Konger anymore. I'm not Chinese because I don't speak. Uh, I speak 1984 Cantonese, <laughs> um, so they're like, "Where are you from?" So. But what I saw, and I think growing up here was a big challenge for me because I was very ashamed to be Chinese because I wanted to assimilate. I wanted to be American. I wanted to, when my mother was speaking to me in the grocery store in Cantonese, I specifically make sure I enunciated, I communicated with her loudly in English. And everyone's like, what's wrong with this kid? Um, but over the years, I realized folks like me are actually it's okay that I don't belong truly into either culture because we are the bridge. There are many of us that are cross-cultural and multicultural that actually become the translator and the code switcher in multiple countries. And I think the solution, and it's not gonna be easy solution, democracy and cooperation and joint partnership and making people understand each other, it's not an easy thing and it's gonna take a long time. But the thing is, if you give up on that conversation, you're never gonna get there. So that's why uh, my background and my education, I actually got my degree in social work and I'm a social worker by training. Uh, and it's a very different fit doing international trade and working on politics, but really it's not because I think everything we do, it's about the communication, about sharing the idea. So to your point in terms of how do they view, I, I think right now we're walking in a very dangerous uh, path and we're in the precipice and it's not only our country, France and Germany, they're facing the same situation. Uh, you're seeing election cycles over in Australia that's becoming more conservative. Uh, you're seeing transformation around the world that's basically shifting on either side and m less and less people are willing to compromise. Um, I used to think that this government, our government is basically elected to basically compromise, to basically argue their points and work together for a solution. But we see nowadays that they don't even talk to each other. I don't think that's the role of government and that's just nationally. Internationally, we need to do a lot more. So hopefully uh, the, the generation now have seen the, the negative impact of basically this single-sided approach and hopefully the leaders of tomorrow will understand that there's, the genie is out of the bottle we need to find a solution together. Holding our ground and not talking each other to, to each other is really not the solution. I actually have said with all the fear about imports, exports, and um, we can resolve that. That's actually not, uh, 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 that's just a tactic that's been utilized by you know political parties to basically get to where they want to go. The dividing line, this, the line in sand, is actually 5G. Um, technology is uh, transforming in a way that basically around the world, especially with 5G, you'll see that you really have to choose whether it's a Western or US technology versus Chinese technology. 
whether it's Huawei, Alibaba, Tencent technology, or whether it's Google, Facebook, you know, Amazon technology. And when 5G kicks in at this point, you're going to see basically this divide. Now, what you also saw recently is China was approaching Germany, uh, I think uh, about five months ago, uh, with this approach and basically uh, uh, proposing to, to provide the 5G technology for Germany. Um, and then at this point, the US government stepped in and said, you better not do it. Because you know if you go with China, you know China's practice mm -hmm. in terms of surveillance. They will basically spy on you, they will take your technology. And at that point, Germany responded, like what you did with Angela Merkel when you spied on our. So for a foreign country uh, like Germany or New Zealand, they are forced to basically pick a side, but both sides have, have you know, kind of really, uh, it's the technology slash the political factor that are associated with it. So yes, artificial intelligence, uh, blockchain technology, um, uh, 5G technology, everything will basically be become this huge divide and we're getting more and more separated because of some of our policies that are created, including the threat of basically saying that, you know, Google, uh, you're not allowed to basically work and provide your technology to Huawei phones in Europe. So now our policies are implemented in that way that prevents the collaboration between the two sides. And now the line is getting more and more uh, uh, drawn out even further away and to a point where I, I think that's where the total, um, where, where the cliff is going to be, where we're not going to be able to step back away from it and that might create uh, tension in a way that will escalate into uh, more um, disputes and violence. So I, I don't know whether that answers your, your question directly, but I do think what you said is absolutely true. Uh, the trade and those policies, I think eventually it will balance itself out. But in the techno technological sense, I don't see a path forward. And that's another thing that I fear and keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm.